This episode of Indie Mogul is sponsored by Syrup. How do you feel about using this camera? I mean, I feel <laughs> <laughs> the truth comes out. Hopla! <laughs> if you want to make your life easy, shoot in your storage area. Looking a, so much better. Already fan- looking so much better. Fan- <laughs> <laughs> Yo, what's going on, guys? Today we're talking about interviews and how to shoot them on any budget and with any location. So today I've got my buddy Casey McBeth. Casey McBeth is an amazing cinematographer that has shot some of the biggest interviews in the world. Tell them about some of the interviews. I work a lot on the Oscars and the Golden Globes. I've shot interviews for George Takei, Kristen Stewart, Steve Carell, Christian Bale. Casey, show them the camera that we're working with today. Um, so typically I like to work with the FSD. Wrong! We're not using this camera. Instead, we're going to be using the Canon 6D, which is a basically a consumer DSLR that you can buy online. It's pretty affordable. We're also going to be using the Syrup Genie 2 motion control system with the Magic Carpet Pro slider. Now, not only is this going to minimize our workload on set, but this is also going to make sure that we get the most dynamic shot that we can out of that second angle. Now, the only other things that we need to produce a good looking interview, basically these three lights here, our super simple run and gun audio setup. And if you want to know more about that, you can find everything that we use in the description down below. Okay, Okay, so you're going to be working with this instead. And of course we need our talent as well too. So we've got our local business owner. This is Kayleen. How's it going? Hello, I'm doing swell. So Kayleen, tell them a little bit about the business that we are making up today. We are Mm -hmm. running a coffee shop slash library slash cat cafe in Brooklyn. Sounds good. This is really gonna apply for any of those interviews that you're doing for corporate or for anything like that. So let's do this. All right, so Casey, what is step number one? Um, So step number one, whenever you walk into a location is obviously to figure out where you're going to shoot. Um, The things that you want to try to keep in mind are how to keep it visually interesting, usually by having depth in the frame. Obviously you've picked a wonderfully challenging location. I chose the most ugly location you could ever possibly shoot, the warehouse here at the office. We're trying to make it hard. So no windows here. We have to light everything from scratch. So what are you looking for when we're trying to figure out where can we set our frame? To be honest, the first thing I do is I look for what I don't want to be in the frame. If we turn around here, this entire wall, it's very naturally dark. No amount of light is going to change that. What's wrong with this location over here? There's nothing that could be useful here for the business owner that we have. Okay, how about this side? What do we got going over here? We have a bathroom going on over <laughs> here. However, she did mention a coffee shop. You've got some microwaves. You've got some coffee <laughs> machines over here. And we've also got a doorway. We can keep that doorway open. We can get some depth with the tables that are already in place. Not only does that give us a great area to stage set decoration, but that's also lots of leading lines that can help bring the eye back to the talent. Let's do this. Where are we putting our talent? Well, like we said, we want depth. The last thing we want to do is push her right up against a wall because that completely ruins everything we were trying to get. So we'll probably drop a chair somewhere here and just to try to line that up, we'll drop our camera somewhere back here. Julian, can we have you come in? Let's talk first about camera placement. So oh, we well, yeah. put this on sticks, right? Well, absolutely. So one of the first things that you're going to have to choose as far as camera placement goes is you're also going to want to take a look at the height of the camera. Okay. So a lot of times people are naturally going to go straight to eye level. I think most people generally benefit from a slightly lower camera position. It makes them feel more of an authority. This one, we're shooting a traditional 24 frame per second sort of thing. That's going to give us a really cinematic look. Um, If you are shooting something for television, definitely check with whoever the post-production coordinator is. And then to just try to keep shutter speed nice, we're just doing a traditional shutter speed of 50. All right, so let's talk a little bit about framing. So where are you moving her and what are you watching for? We're going to be having her look left to right. And because of that, a very traditional way of going about the framing is to have her on the left third of the camera. Mm -hmm. So if you were to vertically cut this frame into thirds, you'd have her on the left side. So we have more lean room on the right side of the frame. It's what we're kind of used to seeing when people are being kind of portrayed a little bit more glamorously. And then as far as headspace goes, which is the amount of room between the top of the frame and their head, I try to go with what seems like between maybe three to four fingers above their head. Mm -hmm. So that way it's not too crowded and it's not too far away. If it's too crowded, it instinctually makes people start feeling a little bit more- Claustrophobic. Claustrophobic, a little bit more nervous and like there's more weight to the scene than you want. 
And if it's too far, the person, first of all, looks short, which yeah. is a very unattractive thing and all actors will freak out. But also it just, it makes the frame feel like it's swimming around a little too much and they're just kind of lost in it. And the worst thing that I see a lot of people doing is they'll do this. They'll just give them a little haircut. Oh my and God. It looks yeah. so bad. Wow. Don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. No haircuts. Typically I try to avoid having laps in the frame. If somebody's sitting, it's not a particularly attractive place to focus on anyways. It just closed bunch up. It just looks awkward. Try to pay attention to where the subject is in relation to the rest of the background. A lot of times if there's plants or whatnot, you don't want them right behind somebody's head. I think this works a lot of the time for beams or things like that. Make sure they aren't poking out of the actor's head. Mm -hmm. Plants, make sure they aren't poking out of their head. Make sure that's clean. The background behind them is all good to go. Yeah. And uh, let's move on to some lighting. Okay, cool. Cool. So I always want to start with my key light. It's one of the most important ones in the frame because it's really what draws the eye to the talent. So we're going to use just a traditional light with a soft box. Nice, soft, attractive, and hopefully easy to control. We can get a nice 45 degree on our talent, so that way she's got some shape and direction to the light. And there we go, we got our light on. Already looking a, so much better. Already looking so much better. A fantastic difference. If you notice, when you look around, we're getting lots of light spill onto our walls. It's kind of uncontrolled as far as the direction that we want to go. To get to that next level of quality, you want to start learning how to control that. So basically what this does is it takes the light and just focuses it forward so it doesn't splash all on the sides. Anymore. Yeah, all it does is it keeps all the light from having too wide of a spill. So now we've lost all the spill on our walls. We've lost most of the spill on the floor here, except for just by our feet. Moving on from here, uh, what are we going on to for our next light? We only brought three lights with us. Yeah, It's pretty unlikely that we'll be able to get through this without keeping our house lights on, like the location lights. So maybe we'll use these for an ambient fill. So what we'll do is we'll jump into setting up a backlight. So the point of a backlight is just to help separate the subject from the background. It just helps chisel them out and really define their shape. Gotcha. So instead of their shoulder kind of falling into shadow, you add a little bit of light there. Now they're separated. Yeah. For kind of dark background. It really helps create a more three-dimensional image out of a two-dimensional image. Okay. okay, so that seems like a pretty great exposure for her. And the nice part is we're getting a good eye light already from the key light. So that's really fantastic. It helps bring life. So what I'd like to do is go out into the hallway and place our last light out there as some sort of like a background light. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, she kind of falls into the background right now. Wow, look at that. All right, cool. We got a third light set up here. So we're going to cram this into the corner and try to get as much spread out of this as possible. I feel like if we add some color to this, then we can kind of help increase kind of not only the focus on our character, but just help separate her further. The only thing I'm seeing now is kind of that strip that we have her in is looking really great. The rest, though, is pretty dull. <laughs> Because it's a great location. For I lack picked. of a better term, yep. I'm seeing a couple of little lamps already on set and we can use those as practicals. I think by adding some pops of light could go a long way into kind of making this location not look like this location. <laughs> so real quick, for people that don't know, a practical light is a light that you put in the actual frame of the camera so that it actually adds a little more visual interest, makes things look a little more interesting. And you can also use them for motivation for the lights that you're using. Absolutely. Not necessarily always important for an interview, but sometimes it's really neat. Cool. So what's the key to using normal lights? Can I just use any old household lamp? So it's a tough question. There's a lot of problems that can come into that. There's the color temperature of the bulb. Right now we're using lights that are daylight balanced. A regular household bulb at full power will usually be too bright and will draw your attention away from the talent. So you need some way to control the amount of light coming out of those. Get one of these things, a hand dimmer, super affordable. They're like $10 at Walmart. So I think the last thing that we can really do here is kind of set back it, right? I think the thing to really kind of bring this set alive is to start bringing in as much production value stuff as we can and removing distracting elements as much as possible. Like right here in particular, very empty. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move this lamp over to the side a little bit. <laughs> this sticker thing's kind of cool. This thing? Yeah, yeah, we can use this thing. So right now it's adding like a little cluster of texture and colors right there. Nothing too distracting because it's not bright enough to really draw the eye like crazy. By keeping our actress as one of the brighter things in the frame, I feel like we're still looking where we need to look. This area on the left side of frame feels a bit heavy. I feel like we need to spread some of this stuff out. I see a rogue coffee cup. 
Okay. <laughs> this is no show like Game, Game of Thrones. This is not Game of Thrones. We don't leave coffee cups. It's pretty darn good. Yeah. Since we've got our main frame nailed down, I think we need to start bringing in second camera. So why do you use more than one camera most of the time? Very unlikely anybody's gonna give you perfect answers, perfect responses, and you're gonna wanna be able to cut through things. There's only so many times you can cut to B-roll mm -hmm. between each shot. So if you have a second angle, it can really simplify editing. It can make the talent seem a lot more first of all, knowledgeable, but also comfortable, which is a really big deal. Recently, I've really fallen in love with using a motorized slider for your close-up or your B camera because the frame is slowly parallaxing. It's constantly changing. It's, it's very visually interesting. And by being motorized, you no longer have to have a whole nother crew person who's gonna struggle with a dolly. So in this case, we are using the Syrup Genie 2. This is the motorized slider that we're gonna be using for that dynamic second angle. Uh, the Syrup Genie 2 and the Magic Carpet are basically just gonna bring up the production value of this shoot. Uh, we've tested it before. I love how silent it is, as well as how easy it is to set up. Basically, when you normally use this kind of gear, you have to sacrifice for the sake of portability, but it's not the case with the Syrup Genie 2 and the Magic Carpet. Both are super small and lightweight. So right here for our second camera, we are using the Canon EOS R. Again, it is a kind of affordable DSLR camera. The reason why we're using two Canon cameras is from the same manufacturer, you're looking to have a lot more similar and matching color science, which is gonna make your post life so much easier. So right now I'm just going through the app-based control system that they have. So all I'm doing is I'm giving it a start keyframe, which is gonna track the location on the slide, yeah. the pan and the tilt. Mm -hmm. And once I lock that in on the start and the end frame, it will constantly be yeah. tracking between that and in theory, should keep her in the same position all the way through. The nice thing is we can go through and add midway points if we need to fine tune anything, Yeah. but we're gonna set a start and a stop point and then just check it out from there. So right now, just to be able to get the same consistent motion back and forth, we've yeah. got the Genie set on bounce. Okay. And all that's gonna do is gonna run that same keyframe animation forwards and backwards until we tell it to stop. It's so it's the, the perfect, perfect worker. It's the perfect second shooter. Yeah. And this is all the kind of thing that you could fit into a backpack if need be. Well, yeah, I mean, if you look at it, all it really is, is your support. It's the slider itself, and then yeah. everything's built in here, and we're just using an app to control it. Yeah, and this right here is all built-in battery, too, so really not a problem there. Next thing is audio, right? Yeah, we, you know, we're shooting an interview, and they're not just going to stare at camera. They're going to say stuff, so. Cool. So neither me nor Casey is an audio expert, so we have an audio expert. Andrew! Hey! Okay. <laughs> he just walks out with a stand. Yeah, I got a stand. <laughs> okay, okay. You said so, half stand will travel. This real quick is Andrew. <laughs> Andrew's the head of DD Microphones. He is also basically a professional sound mixer that has worked with GQ. He's mic like Mark Wahlberg, Demi yeah, Lovato, Melissa so. McCartney, all of them. Yeah. yeah. Can you show us what kind of mics we need and how to actually make this? Oh yeah, this is gonna be real easy to set up. First thing I want to do is I want to see your framing so I don't dip into your shot. Here's what our shot looks like. Look at how pretty it is. Okay. We made this warehouse look so much better. That looks really this nice. Is so ugly before. So what I'm gonna do here is we're gonna just a simple boom on a stand. Cool. I think that's the best. Uh, most people like to choose like shotguns when they do videos, but for an interview, it's actually not needed. Hmm. Uh, we're not outdoors, we're indoors. So actually a hypercarded or just a regular cardioid pencil mic mm -hmm. is actually the ideal kind of microphone for the situation. Drop this guy in. I'm using a basic boom holder. So what are we watching for when we've actually got our boom pole rigged up? So the first thing I'm watching for is shadows. Now that I'm rigged up, I wanna look to see where I'm casting the shadows from the key light. So that's typically the one that's going to be casting the shadows. So the best place to get mic placement is typically if you, you know, create like a little horn mm -hmm. and put it right here on your head, like yep. a unicorn, right there's where you want the microphone. Gotcha, so Kayleen, can you give us a quick little bugle? Right Looking there. Looking good. All right, so, so yeah, right, right there. in there. And I'm not pointing it directly at her mouth. What I'm actually doing is I'm pointing that microphone at her chest area. Most people think you point it at the mouth and that's fine. But if they ever slope in the middle of an interview, mm -hmm. you miss out. And all of a sudden you're shooting that microphone right into the forehead mm -hmm. and it does sound different. Yeah. At the same time, a lot of people also talk from the chest and the throat and the actual mouth itself. So you get this fuller sound when you actually point it here instead of here. Real quick, what are we plugging this microphone into? So we're plugging it into a Zoom H5 because it is a nice running gun basic recorder. 
At the same time, it actually sounds pretty good. And these kinds of microphones that you put on boom poles are traditionally not the kind of microphones you can plug into a DSLR. So you will need to get yourself a nice recorder. So we've got our mic set up and everything, but the actual room itself, if I, I can hear kind of an echo, yeah. right? And the problem is we've got this giant brick wall behind us yeah. and that is also causing some of the issues. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up some sound blankets and that's gonna really dampen the room and kind of keep the audio from just bouncing around all in the room, ruining our audio. So after I've set up the sound blanket, I'm gonna listen again. We've already done that, but I can also tell, I've also got some problems with this hard concrete floor. So I'm just gonna throw a blanket on the floor just to kind of kill any standing wave going from this floor to ceiling. Spend a little extra time in production getting better audio. It's a lot harder to fix bad audio in post. So now that we've got our last blanket on the floor, is there anything else we should do? No, I think we're good to go. Cool, sounds good. Get out of here. <laughs> audio department's gone. Back to shooting the interview, let's do this. So. Now we're back at camera, first camera set up, second camera set up on our second shooter. We've got our microphone set up, sound blankets, lighting is done, we're ready to shoot. Yeah, I think the best thing now is to talk to our talent, make sure they're comfortable, they know what's gonna happen. We can start you know, breaking the ice with the interviewer, set them up, get everything to roll in. Cool, so I'm gonna be the interviewer today. Biggest mistakes to avoid as an interviewer, first of all, you want to be quiet. A lot of times we're used to talking to somebody. So when they say something we're like, damn, that's crazy. Or wow, okay, mm -hmm. awful for the audio. Okay. So you wanna just let people roll, give nonverbal cues because it is a conversation that you're just recording. The second thing that you wanna do is everybody gets very excited once they know somebody's about to finish speaking and they go, oh, that's great. So you just wanna make sure that whenever you're speaking to somebody and you're giving them just that gap to finish. So that way you can have nice, clear audio. Another one, and this one is always really difficult, continually remind your subject to repeat the question that you've asked them in their answer. So if you say, what did you have for breakfast? A lot of people say, bacon and eggs. But if you just cut out that thing, it's just a weirdo in a chair saying, bacon and eggs. <laughs> so if you try to remind them, hey, you know, just say, oh, this morning for breakfast, I had bacon and eggs. It will make the interview process of editing a lot simpler and more informative to whoever's watching it. All righty, you ready to do this? Oh, I'm ready. Sounds good. All right, we're going to go for a take here with Kayleen. Again, fake business today. We're doing a coffee shop bookstore that we're going to be talking about. So. <laughs> Well, I think with our place, you get a little bit of everything. You get a bookstore, you get a hangout space, you get a lovely cafe, and you get cats. Now, why cats? Why not dogs? Just talking, I'm sorry, I messed it up. I apologize, try it again. <laughs> so, did you have a cat when you were younger? Of course I had a cat when I was younger. Her name was Wheezy. We called her Weasley because we were obsessed with Harry Potter but she was a cute little rescue cat. She drooled out of one side of her mouth because she was missing a tooth. We just loved her. We wanted to make sure everyone knew, so we named it Wheezy's Cat Cafe. I am Veronica, and I run a Brooklyn cat cafe slash bookstore for the LGBTQ community. That's a pretty good interview. It seemed to work out all right. Very good. <laughs> Sounds good. That was great. That was fun. Yeah. Now, did you notice how easy it was to fall into conversational where you're just you're starting to step on lines? And like, oh, so no, I did step on some lines. You, you got yourself a couple of times, but as it goes on, it's hard to kind of remember that because you get excited, you get invested. But I think, you know, with all things, practice makes perfect. So. All righty, guys. So there you go. There's your episode on how to shoot interviews. Again, no excuses out there. If we were able to make this warehouse location work for us, you really have no excuses to make a beautiful frame. This is Casey. Where can they find you? Uh, you can find me best at Instagram at McBro underscore FTW. Kayleen, where can they find you? Also Instagram at Kayleen Casey. And Andrew's back. Andrew, where can they find you? Uh, Andrew from Deity on Instagram. Absolutely, cool. And this, of course, is Indie Mogul. If you got any questions, leave them in the comments down below. We're gonna go hop in there and actually answer those questions in real time, but there you guys have it. Hope you guys have an absolutely amazing day, and we'll catch you guys next time. So a lot of times, if you need it, you can use your hand to kind of simulate somebody's head until somebody sits in. And as long as you're on access to the camera, you get kind of like the same angle of reflectance. Well, we don't tend to have too many problems. We keep a solid eye on all of our cats to make sure they're not trying to munch on anyone's food, but mostly it's endearing if they do. It's pretty easy to shoo away one of our cats.